Mark. He'll play action from his own end zone. Now has to scramble, run for his life. He'll get out across the five, up to the ten, and then he's drilled by a tackler. The ball is knocked loose. It's on the turf. Making the hit for the Wolverines there was Aaron Benson. And let's see if Wesley indeed has the football as Rocco took an awful big plug. And Wesley has the football, a turnover for the Purple Raiders. Linfield with a chance to take the lead for the first time in this third quarter. And Patterson to his left. Saunders motions across the formation. It's Bowie on the keeper, lunging for the end zone, reaching with his right hand and scoring. And Linfield leads 13 to 10 on their opening possession of the second half. Amos Alonzo Stag Bowl is back in Salem for the 17th straight year. And once again, the D3 title tilt in Virginia's championship city will be a history-making event. For the first time in 37 years, the same teams are playing for the title for the fifth consecutive season. The last four meetings have been offensive shootouts, with the two teams combining for 223 points. Some of the stars from those previous games are back, along with a lot of new faces on both sides of the ball. Mount Union Whitewater. It's become D3's marquee final dance card pairing of the decade. A rivalry that is fueled by a commitment to excellence and mutual respect. Dynasty, baby! Whitewater never had to leave home during the first four rounds of the playoffs, opening with a 70-7 pasting of Lakeland. The Warhawks then whipped Illinois Wesleyan 45-7 in round two, before topping Wittenberg 31-13 in the quarterfinals. That win over Wittenberg set up a semifinal matchup featuring two six-foot, five-inch quarterbacks in Whitewater. Linfield made the trek from Oregon and arrived in Wisconsin just days after a winter blast had swept through the town. Snow blanketed the Whitewater area, creating a winter wonderland worthy of Christmas card consideration. But looks can be deceiving this time of year in Wisconsin, and even the inanimate statues couldn't escape the grip of Old Man Winter. But game day conditions at Perkins Stadium couldn't have been any better for mid-December. The temperature was near 30 with partly sunny skies and very light winds as the field turf surface got its first national semifinal workout. The solid conditions also seemed to suit Lance Leipold's son Landon, who definitely had his game face on. And the home team would not disappoint him in the opening minutes, making an early statement on its second drive of the game. Lavelle Coppage turns what looks like a short gain off left tackle into a 55-yard burst to pay dirt as Whitewater takes a 7-0 lead with 6.22 left in the opening period. It stayed that way into the final five minutes of the opening half. First, Whitewater senior Jeff Shebler hit this 34-yard field goal to make it 10-0 Warhawks. But Linfield seized the momentum to close the first half. Ryan Henderson caught this nine-yard TD pass from Aaron Bomey. That score, coupled with a goal line stand in the final minute, made it a 10-7 game at the halftime break. And Linfield began the third quarter by taking the opening drive 78 yards in seven plays. And when Bomey stepped in from the four-yard line, Whitewater found itself behind on the scoreboard for the first time all season, trailing 14-10 less than five minutes into the second half. Linfield came in here, they were determined, you know, to get a victory. Um, but I think the resolve of our guys, you know, our senior class, our team as a whole, uh, we weren't going to let that happen. And, um, you know, we were down late, but we bounced back and, you know, we showed what we were made of. I'm not going to lie, we were kind of worried going through the game that we were down a little bit. But, uh, you know, you keep playing, you keep doing what you got to do, and good things will happen. 
We know there's different times where you got to step up, whether it be first quarter or fourth quarter. And I, I think uh, with the experience that we've been able to get through these last few years with this group, uh, they were ready for that challenge and, and rose to it. Coaches always talk about the ebbs and flows of the game. You, you got to just keep grinding, keep pounding the rock, keep making plays. And, you know, we got down there a little bit in the beginning towards the end of the game, but, you know, we never lost our confidence, never lost our swagger, and just, you know, we were confident that we'd come through and make the plays when we needed, and that's what we did. Whitewater appeared to answer the bell immediately when Donovan went deep down the middle to Corey Robinson for a 39-yard scoring strike. But the celebration was short-lived as a pass interference penalty wiped out the play and forced a punt three plays later. There were more anxious moments on the first play of the fourth quarter as the visiting Wildcats pushed their advantage to 17-10 with this 35-yard field goal. Shebler got that three back on the ensuing drive when he nailed this kick to make it 17-13 with 12.36 to go. And the next time Whitewater got the ball back, the Warhawks took care of that deficit once and for all. Donovan hits Jordan Wells on a quick out in front of the Whitewater bench. And the senior from Elgin, Illinois, breaks the arm tackle and heads down the sideline, carrying the ball all the way to the one-yard line. The Donovan to Wells connection resulted in 68 yards and set the table for Antoine Anderson to bang in from the one. That put Whitewater back on top 20 to 17 with 7.34 to play. The Whitewater defense then did its part, forcing the last of the three interceptions it would get on the day. Coppage added an insurance burst with a minute to play as UW Dub comes from behind in the fourth quarter to beat Linfield 27 to 17. The Warhawks remain unbeaten and advance to the Stag Bowl for the fifth straight season. And the one thing is, that as you look at the roster, you know, from from a year or two, you know, that roster kind of changes with only 52 players getting to suit up. So a lot of players, it is a first experience or be, maybe just a second. And and for, for the way we're treated and the hospitality and the first class, uh, you know, bowl the way it's run by, by the people of Salem and the Roanoke area is just outstanding and it'll never get old for any of them. The defending national champs from Mount Union also were able to stay at home throughout the entire postseason. The Purple Raiders shut out WNJ 55 to nothing and then manhandled Montclair State 62 to 14 in the second round before pummeling Albright 55 to three in the quarterfinals. That domination set up a semifinal showdown with Delaware's Wesley College on a crisp Saturday afternoon in Alliance. The sun was shining brightly in Ohio, and as is usually the case on game day, a purple haze covered the entire campus. Wesley was hoping to derail a dynasty, but soon found out there are a lot of working parts in the Mount Union machine. On their opening drive against Wesley, the Purple Raiders quickly found the end zone with quarterback Kurt Rocco firing a 15-yard touchdown pass to Cecil Shorts. Mount Union takes a 7-0 lead on the Wolverines. Mount Union got another three on its second possession, and it looked like the route was on. But later in the first, Rocco was forced to scramble out of the pocket, and the hit he took right at the end of the run from Aaron Benson sent him to the sidelines for the rest of the game. The unfortunate incident showed once again the resourcefulness of the Mount Union coaching staff and the wealth of talent on the home side. Offensively, we didn't have the type of day we sometimes have, but our defense was solid throughout against a real fine Wesley team. Uh, Wesley was, came into this game undefeated, uh, very well coached with some outstanding athletes. First, the Mount Union defense stepped up to pick up the slack by intercepting two potential scoring passes in the opening half. Basically, I wanted to you know, help stop the run, of course, you know, playing up front, and I wanted to get pressure on the quarterback. As a D-line, you know, we made that a priority. Mount Union decided to go to the Wildcat full time after intermission with the dangerous shorts at the controls. The senior from Cleveland put the offense on his back and carried the male and his teammates all the way back to Salem by rushing for 98 yards on 18 carries and scoring two second half touchdowns to provide the Purple Raiders with enough cushion to keep the Wolverines at bay. The Mount Union defense held Wesley to just 55 yards rushing and under 200 total yards for the game while forcing three interceptions. Mount Union remains unbeaten with the 24-7 win 
and returns to Salem for the 13th time since 1993. I think I played pretty good, but it was mainly as a team performance. I think the offensive line blocked well. Kurt threw a wonderful pass on that one um, skinny post he threw. And it was just, my job was easy after that, just catching her in. You know, I think we just have that brotherhood. You know, we, we care about one another. And, and I'm not saying that the past three teams didn't, but it's just, it feels different this year. It feels like I'd do anything for the guy next to me, and they, they do the same thing for me. And we're going to take that all the way to Salem.